everyone. Welcome here at Setla for one of the lectures in our lecture series. Um, my name is Barbara Hogeboom. I'm very uh, yeah, happy we have uh, Dr. Lucas Poy today here with us in, uh, in the University of Amsterdam. He didn't travel that far. Um, he is Argentine from origin, but he has been working already for some years in the VU University, also here in, um, in Amsterdam. He is a social and labor historian. Um, I was looking what books we have, have from you in our library, I always like to see. Fortunately, we have one physical, which I will uh, share uh, around, Los Orígenes de la Clase Obrera Argentina. Um, this book, which is about the late 19th century, also shows a little bit where you usually are focused on, which kind of period. Uh, you've also uh, written a book on the Socialist Party, where we have the ebook in our collection, but I cannot show you. But I, um, yeah, if you're interested and you are studying or working in this university, you can also have a look. So, um, and uh, when we were discussing what from all the things that you know a lot about, you could bring to to this room and to this audience, we realized that all the political and social changes currently happening in Argentina um, are too important to focus mainly on a uh, hundred years uh, ago. But um, I hope that in your talk, you will manage to make that bridge between the glorious or not so glorious history and uh, and uh, yeah, the, the current situation with the new president that is uh, uh, trying to make uh, very profound um, uh, changes in, uh, in Argentina. Um, <clears throat> apart from you being assistant professor in uh, global economic and social history, in view, you are also uh, connected to two institutes here in the, in the Netherlands, I think, or, or, or now still one, yeah, the, the Posthumous Institute and the uh, International Institute of Social History, uh, which is also here uh, in the University of Am uh, sorry, in Amsterdam, the city of Amsterdam. Um, yeah. I think what you're going to talk about will not be such a, yeah. A, 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 yeah, a glorious picture or happy story, but I think we can learn a lot from what you know about Argentina today and its history. So very much welcome. After your talk, we will have uh, Michiel Baut, historian uh, of, of CETLA, um, uh, and also someone who knows quite a bit about uh, Argentina's current and historical developments to, to start off the conversation and then I will open the room. We are with many people, I will open the room to see what questions, what thoughts there are in this room. Um, and then around five o'clock, I will close the meeting here, but uh, we can continue, um, uh, yeah, uh, talking to each other upstairs at the fifth room uh, over drinks. Uh, so you're all we welcome to join us also at five o'clock. Lucas, yours, yours. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming, uh, everybody. Um, or not so uh, conversation. So I am very happy that I was invited. I'm very thankful, but I'm not so happy that I have to be talking. I have to give in this talk or the, the kind of things I have to talk about today uh, because they are quite disturbing uh, for most of us who are from Argentina or related or interested or attached uh, to Argentina in many ways. The news that keep on coming almost every day from uh, people you know from Argentina, but also from uh, scholars, from uh, educators, from uh, educational institutions, scientific institutions are very concerning in, in, from Argentina, as you probably everybody in this room is aware of. Uh, I must say also I have changed a bit what I was going to say, uh, or at least I added a bit of an extra introduction. Uh, re um, because in the last couple of weeks, also the, the certain things that happened related to the uses of history in relation to the, the, the celebration, the anniversary of the military dictatorship uh, in the last 24th of March, the kind of things also, and very much related to the topic of today, let's say very much related to the uses or misuses of history. There's, a, well, I will say something about that in the beginning and I will say a bit less about 100 years ago, uh, but I will try to connect both in some ways. Um, to start with, uh, well, this photo kind of, um, I have to say Millet perhaps did not, perhaps we can have a talk about that later. Many colleagues in Argentina asked me about that, how much people are talking about this in other parts, let's say. I have the impression that it's happening less than what happened with Bolsonaro uh, some four or five years ago. Uh, I had the impression it was more of an impact 
Uh, not everybody, of course, people were happy and some people are happy also with Millet, I, but you get my point. There were some uh, concerns, some discussions about Bolsonaro. Of course, Brazil is a much bigger country. Uh, now, uh, I have the impression there is less of that. Millet is not exactly the same as Bolsonaro. Trump is not there now. There is a war going on. Uh, there are many reasons for this. But, uh, but one thing is, is certain, this image kind of uh, navigated the world. People kind of uh, remembered this idea of the chainsaw. For those who don't, uh, in his campaign, uh, Javier Millet uh, was not only showing, but actually activating a chainsaw, which is extremely dangerous. So if you see the videos, you see that they actually turn it on with people really close by. There was no accident by chance. Uh, basically conveying the idea that he wanted to uh, seriously cut the expenses of or the budget of the state. That was one of his main um, um, campaign promises. And you must say three months later, uh, Millet took, won the election in the, in the second round. As you probably remember, he, he won the first round. Uh, uh, then there was a second round with the, with, with the two first candidates, uh, Sergio Massa and Javier Millet. And Javier Millet won by ar around 56 against 44% something like that. That was in November, and in December 10, he took office, uh, right before the summer holidays and the summer break. Uh, but that's a day that presidents take office in Argentina. And so we have now more than three months of government of Javier Millet, almost four months. And we must say that he kind of delivered uh, his promise in terms of the motosierra, as you say, a chainsaw. Uh, I have some numbers. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, the expenses of the state. We don't have to go into detail, but you see some very significant uh, movements on the chart. This is what the what the what the state uh, spends. Uh, and in Spanish, for those of you who are familiar with the Spanish language, or at least in the Argentinian version, now people talk in Argentina about the combination about motosierra and licuadora. Uh, that's a bit more technical. Licuadora is, I would say, a blender. I don't know the word in Dutch now. Uh, how you say blender in Dutch? Blender. Yeah. <laughs> but blender sounds nice. Okay, you blend something. In, in, in Spanish, liqua is to, uh, to make liquid or something. And the idea of licuadora is that uh, instead of just cutting nominally something, you, you increase a salary much less than the inflation. That's what in Argentina everybody calls licuadora. The, the, so you, there's an inflation of 30% per month, and you increase the salary for 10%. Then you don't need to cut the salary of anybody. That's a way of cutting the salary. So this combination of what is called now, everybody's talking about this, Motosierra and Licuadora. Even the IMF had to learn the, the terms because they have the talk with Millet and they talk about this. Uh, so uh, some contribution of the Spanish language for the IMF officials. Uh, the combination really makes, makes numbers who are really scary when you see what can this mean in terms of uh, the, the, the income and the life of people. Also, that kind of collapsed, uh, that he wants basically to stop the inflation via uh, recession. He kind of openly says that because Argentina was having a 250% inflation last year. That's one of the main reasons Millet won. We can discuss that later, but we cannot. Uh, and of course, one way to, to keep this, one way to stop it is to completely cut the, the spending and and that, of course, made the, the sales. This is the, 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 the comparison of annual, annual comparison of sales of shops or others and uh, what the collapse. So retail sales and collapse. You feel that I was in Argentina last month and you feel it's like uh, gradually the inflation is going down, basically because some people's salary is like 30 or 40 percent less in, in real terms. So, well, necessarily you have to, to cut your spending. And that means that the prices cannot go up so, so much, uh, even when increasing the price of gas and other things. Uh, so another really massive, and all the charts that you look now in Argentina, they all look like this. They all look like incredibly sharp uh, decreases. Uh, this is uh, another chart, same idea, uh, the average salary, and this is the poverty line. Of course, what is the poverty line in this country can depend. Uh, this is the Pluto, this is the average salary, and the, the 100 uh, was, uh, I think, somewhere here. So well, you see you see the collapse. So the, 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 all the, the kind of the charts, the trends, seem to go in the same 
uh, direction. Um, more specifically in our field, uh, because of course I could go, go about with many other examples, I will not do that. Uh, one of the impacts that he's having because of these massive cuts is uh, on the public sector and in the universities. You might have heard about this, also perhaps colleagues who are involved or reaching out with uh, campaigns or something. Uh, the rectors of the universities, of course, they are also interested in, in pointing it, mentioning, making it this way. They are saying, because basically what Millet said that is that you can, you will have the same budget as in 2023. With 250% inflation, you get the idea of what it means. So they did the math and they say, okay, this is only for May. Until May, we have money. After May, we don't have more money. Of course, this is also a way of saying after May, they will get some kind of adjustment. But the situation is really quite dramatic in terms of the uh, budget of public institutions of education, which are the way the, the vast majority of public uh, of universities or public universities in Argentina. All the colleagues that you might know from Argentina working in university, I bet most of them work in public university. So they are, uh, everything is uh, in, in risk. Salaries are 96% of the expense of Argentinian universities. So only 4% is whatever else, overhead, whatever. So that's what usually gets a cut. And of course, that means a very serious impact in infrastructure that is serious for everybody, but completely dramatic for uh, life sciences, for instance, of certain things, because basically people don't have money to buy anything, any books, forget about buying books, but even buying a lab or, or uh, materials, etc. Uh, you might also have heard about CONICET. CONICET is the major uh, scientific institution in Argentina, according to the CIMAGO rank, is the second uh, or the first in, uh, in Ibero-America. So it's a very uh, well-respected institution with, with around 20,000 uh, scientists. It's a bit similar to the CNRS in, in France, perhaps, in the sense that it employs people directly. There's not such an equivalent here to compare. Uh, but many, many of the scholars you might know are also employed by, by Conicet. Uh, Conicet was really all the time in the campaign of Millet. There is a tremendous campaign against the people of, of, about, the, uh, about the scientists. Basically, what they do is they go to the uh, repository, so what here is called PURE, for instance, which is mandatory for everybody to put their research there. So it's public, right, because it's public money. So they have an army of trolls basically going to everybody, finding things that might sound a bit weird or that people say, why are we funding this? And they do horrible campaigns in, on social media. Many people left social media because of this, put the log in their account, because they said, did you know that uh, Barbara is doing this and wrote this paper about this? Do you think that we should subsidize this in a country with such, so much problems or so many problems? And that really has a serious toll in, in, well, in everybody, as you can imagine. On top of that, uh, they are now firing uh, people with uh, casual contracts in Conicet, which is mostly the supporting personnel. This photo of last week, uh, some sort of picket line. Uh, nobody is redundant here, says in the, in, in the, in, in the banner. This is happening as we speak. So there are uh, all kind of, uh, since I, I wanted to start also with this to get you an impact and also to, make you uh, familiar if you were not already with what is happening. And uh, if you get in touch with any scholar in Argentina, it's hard to talk about anything else or just because their livelihoods are uh, uh, in danger. Um, on top of that, and this is what I added, on top of that, what happened in the last two weeks was really disturbing. Uh, one day before the 24th of March, which as you know, is the anniversary of the military coup of 1976, there was uh, an attack on a, on a, on a, to a member of IHOS. You know, IHOS is one of the organizations of the, the, disappeared, the children of disappeared uh, people. And they, uh, well, they entered her house. They abused her also. They didn't rob anything. They, and they, they left uh, Viva la Libertad Carajo, which is the, like the, the motto of Millet. So it's a sort of fascist kind of attack which is not widespread yet. Everybody was like kind of, when is this going to happen? Happened one day before. Of course you can say it can be a, a, a one time thing, but still this happened. Everybody was extremely concerned. Um, and I will start to get to my point now because you see on the day of uh, the 24th of March, perhaps you've come across this. Uh, if not, I don't know if you want to come across this. 
uh, they posted an official video. So this is the official account of the of the government, the Casa Rosada. Uh, and they have, they they just posted this. This is the official day of the it's a holiday in, in Argentina. Uh, and they posted a video. Uh, and and, and in the video was really, really disturbing. Basically, it was not even the, the theory of the two demons, as they call it in Argentina, two devils, but it was mostly the idea that, well, this was the former Montonero gorilla, which is one of the uh, is one of the examples of the people who said there was uh, the problem was the gorilla, etc. So you get more or less the, the point of the of the video, you know, or well, you can watch it. Um, another um, so basically to kind of completely go against much of the consensus. We might discuss how that came to be that uh, took place after the dictatorship in in, in, in 1983. Uh, extremely confronting, really moving the moving the targets. Okay, now we're going to discuss this. We're going to discuss again to uh, reconcile with the, with the military, perhaps to give subsidies to the people who were killed by the armed organizations in the 70s. Uh, so quite a, a counterattack, a very serious counterattack that completely reshaped the, 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 the political tone of, of, of that day. Uh, this happened. Um, um, two weeks ago, something like that. Uh, actually, as a consequence of during that day, and I invite you all to look for this. Uh, it's easy to find if you can Google in Spanish. More than 100 or historians actually signed a letter uh, about, well, the topic that Barton and I had decided to talk about, the use of history and Millet. Mm -hmm. uh, the main reason for the, the letter is not what I was going to talk today, but mostly what is he's doing about the dictatorship of the last 50 years, let's say, of Argentinian history. Uh, that's mostly what uh, the letter is about. It's circulating widely. It shows that there's really a, a deep concern uh, by, by the colleagues uh, to say something about what they consider, and I agree, a, a, a manipulation of, of history. Um, and of course, we can discuss where every political group, everybody approaches history in such a way. Or, but here, there, there are some levels of manipulation and, and uh, rejection of the most basic facts that are uh, quite concerning. Uh, and as I said, you open the news from Argentina every day, and every day is a new blow. On top of that, this is a very serious epitome of dengue. Uh, very serious. I mean, everybody knows someone who is sick, uh, quite seriously. So it's like one blow after another. So it's really, I mean, we're used to blows, I think, uh, but it's been a bit too much, I think, in the last couple of months, and everybody's quite taken aback. So this is kind of the context, uh, context of the government that is doing a bit what they promised. And uh, this was also the topic of my uh, talk. Uh, uh, a figure like Millet, who is especially keen to talk about history, because you might also have, I mean, Macri uh, or others, um, uh, right-wing politicians, center-right politicians, did not really engage so much with politics, with history. Uh, Millet has a, a permanent uh, trend to go back into that, perhaps also drawing on the idea of Donald Trump, uh, this idea of make America great again, so he uh, completely uh, conveys that idea. But he has, uh, uh, makes a point of talking about historical facts, the past of Argentina, and also about economics. He's an, econom an economist himself, a very hardcore, um, yeah, marginalistic, neoliberal economics. And he's talking all the time about names uh, of economics of the Austrian school and uh, of um, something about the historical past. Uh, this is one example. He's, he said this in his stories in Spanish, but you will get the point quite easily. He said this in his uh, um, inauguration address. Uh, and he said that many times this was already checked by his fact checkers, and it's not true. Uh, but it rings a bell. Uh, like they say in Italian, se non è vero è ben trovato. So it's, if it's not true, it's somewhere there, and that's why it resonates. So he said, and Argentina started the 20th century being the richest country in the world, and today is in the, in the position 140. And so, uh, taking the, the, the legal dollar as a measure, as much as that. 
So of course now there are around 280 uh, 80 countries in the world. Uh, and one thing Argentinians don't like is to be in the middle of any table. So I just want to be in the best or in the worst, but never in the middle. Uh, so he says that, because if he said we're in the last, everybody would have been like, okay, <laughs> you're 140, he's like, no. Uh, uh, we can spend late the border talking about jokes about Argentinians because they're all podcasts. Uh, yesterday I heard one that says, do you know what two Argentinians do uh, on the Eiffel Tower? They look how Paris looks without them. Um, so anyway, that's the, to put in some uh, humor on this tragic history. And then a bit more precise, but still not correct. 120 years ago, Argentina had one of the third GDP per capita, uh, the highest GDP per capita in the world. He said this in a, in a, in a not so long in our world speech. So this, he comes once and again to this idea. And this was one of the core of my talks. He seems to come once and again to the idea that Argentina was a great country until something started to go really bad. This decadent approach to uh, Argentinian history is not new. Alperin Dongi wrote a lot about this, uh, which is perhaps the most important historian that we have had. Uh, so we are aware of this. There's a long history in Argentina to talk about the decadence of Argentina. Uh, of course, there's a lot of truth or facts in it. Argentina seemed, seems to be a country that is impossible to understand if you how things go so bad all the time. So all these kind of stereotypes have come. Um, but in particular, Millet is more precise than that. He always talks about the same period, and it seems to be the period that goes from around the 1880s to 1912, 1916. Those of you who are more familiar with the history of Argentina might know that this is a period known as the Orden Conservador, the conservative regime, and mostly is the period right before the, the electoral reform that did not implement uh, in universal suffrage. That's a mistake, it's not, it's not exactly that what happened. It, it became mandatory and secret, uh, uh, the votes, and it really changed the political regime because we, Argentina moved from a very fraudulent regime, I will talk a bit about that later, to a democracy of sorts. And of course, the conservatives lost power when, and Hippolyte uh, Rigoni took power when, uh, in 1916, the radical party, the Union Civita Radical. So it's quite remarkable that he says, well, right before that, we were the, the most, uh, uh, the richest, or the, we were doing well, and then stopped. This is important to, 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 to stress because another more common stereotype or uh, discourse is that everything went okay until Perón. But that's a, perhaps a more common uh, narrative in Argentinian politics. It's like, okay, everything was okay, somehow somewhat okay until the, the 30s, but mostly about until the 40s. In the 40s, everything went down uh, when Perón came. This is a narrative that also allows uh, the, the, the radical party, the, the radicales, to be part of it. Millet is not saying that. Millet is clearly saying that it was a period. Um, and he touches then on a very, a, a period that is sometimes obsessively present in the history of Argentina. The presence of the conservative regime, the period of, of the modelo agroexportador, we say in Spanish, the agroexport model. So the period in which Argentina, like many other countries in Latin America, don't say that to Argentinians because usually they don't like it. Uh, like many other countries in, in Latin America and in the world also, ensembled somehow with the, the, the Western, European, and American economies as producers of commodities. And therefore had a, a series of changes. We will say something about that in a moment. That's really the period. And it's a period that is kind of always, uh, and there are a, a number of elements that I will go uh, about now in, in the remaining of my, my, my talk which is what was that regime then, and what is another obsession of uh, the conversation uh, of this period, which is immigration and the role of immigration, particularly European immigration. To show that this is not just something of Javier Millet, this is something that the former president, the uh, ill uh, remembered, and it's going to be even worse here as time goes by, he said this to Pedro Sanchez. So he said this, is here. Those who read Spanish can see how dramatic. Mexicans came from the indigenous peoples, Brazilians came from the jungle, but we Argentinians came out of the ships, uh, the steamships. Basically, he was there, he wanted to be nice to Pedro Sanchez. Ah, we come from, we are like you. He said this, I, believe me, I, I, I kid you not. They had to apologize, of course, and explain. 
But the interesting thing is that he said that from the top of his head, and it's something that people say sometimes. <laughs> you know, yeah. Of course, we don't come from. Uh, but he said came from the Indians, came from the from the jungle, and we came from the from the boats. So I mean, we are transplanted Europeans here. That's the the message he wants to convey. I'm not going to talk about about Alberto Fernandez today, but this only to show that we would be able to find a lot of remarks about this period uh, and about the role of immigrants and how they transplanted. But let's uh, forgive him for a while and go back to the topic of delay. So this is the core of my argument. This period, the conservative order or the agro-export model to translate into English, uh, occupies the central place in Argentine history in the constructions of the country's memory, not only of Javier Millet's construction. This is not new, he's not really inventing anything here, but there are some elements that he stresses more, and I want to say something about that. So the idea of Argentina uh, being a prosperous country, a prosperous region, a world power, and having lost its way somewhere. Uh, there are more academic uh, explanations of this, and there are less academic, less scholarly. The, 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 the latter are a majority. Um, we can also, but that, it will be a bit too technical uh, for Argentinian history, can extend a bit to the back, to, to, the, to the period starting with the fall of Juan Manuel de Rosas in 1852 to 1880, and the ideas of the intellectuals of what is called the generation of 1837. Another obsession of Millet, and I will say that about the moment, is about Juan Bautista Alberdi, and I will say something about him now. This is Roca, uh, president of Argentina, two times, this is Bartolome Mitre, another very famous uh, uh, former president, founder of the newspaper La Nación in Argentina, etc. So this period encapsulates um, a lot of uh, images, a lot of uh, resonates in almost every discussion, and Millet suddenly put it back again in the in the forefront. And now people sometimes in the public uh, opinion, uh, people who are not so interested in the history are talking about this again. Uh, unfortunately, with a lot of information that has already proven wrong by many historians uh, in the last 40 years and also before. Um, so these are two of the main characters of the story. Uh, probably you know, uh, you might know both. And uh, Sarmiento was president of Argentina. Uh, this was Juan Bautista Lorenz, who was not president. Uh, and, but both are considered sometimes kind of, well, this is another example. Founding, he, Millet sometimes talks about founding fathers in Spanish, right? Padres fundadores, which is a term that nobody ever used in the Argentinian discussion. But he wants perhaps to convey some similarities to the American uh, conversation. In Argentina, you might talk about proced, but not really about founding father. Uh, Sometimes he refers uh, about them, but mostly about Alberti. Alberti. Um, so who are these guys? Uh, very briefly, they are uh, exponents of what sometimes is called the generation of 1837. They were romantic thinkers of the mid 19th century. They were very strongly opposed to Juan Manuel de Rosas, who was one of the uh, perhaps the most important uh, caudillo leaders of the 19th century in Argentina. And they came back to some prominence when Rosas failed in 1852. And they were extremely influential in setting the structure of the modern Argentinian state. Um, Alberti is so attached, uh, Millet is so attached to this. These are the two most famous books of these two. This is the most famous book of Albertis Alberti, and this is the most famous book of Sarmiento. This book is most commonly known as Facundo. Sarmiento was a brilliant writer. Also, so Facundo is probably one of the best books, in, also in literary terms, of the 19th century Argentina. Uh, and this is a much more legal text, which served as a blueprint, almost literally, of the constitution of Argentina. Mm -hmm. So it's a very long text, Bases y Puntos de Partida para la Organización Política de la República Argentina. So some starting points for, uh, uh, for uh, the or political organization of the country. And the constitution of 1853, which is still the one that is there, uh, was really almost based on this. To the point that if you go now to any website in Argentina news, they talk about the Bases bill. So what is the Bases bill? It's because they sent the bill to Congress to make a lot of reforms that he wants to do. And he named it Bases Punto Partida for the refoundation of Argentina. 
to that point. And, and he put like, a, he tried to make it a, 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 to present it as an old book. Like really there was like a, an attempt to really make it a connection with, with, uh, with uh, Alberti. So somehow now everybody's talking about Alberti, a couple of colleagues, because there were not so many who were experts in Alberti now are really saying, look, stop talking about Alberti without reading something at least, uh, because this is kind of, everybody's going crazy about it. So what is the core of this? Uh, one of the core arguments of this was that Argentina to grow and to really uh, became a, a civilized country had to first of all defeat Rosas, which happened in 52. And second, to have Europeans coming, uh, preferably North Europeans. Both of them, Sarmiento more nicely in terms of literary quality, but both of them argued that the main problem of Argentina it was it was that it was empty. Uh, many conversations that you hear, you read here, is almost connect Argentina to, to the discussion in white settler colonies of the British Empire, in the sense that even after Argentina, of course, was an independent uh, country at the time. This idea that, and the constitution of Argentina is extremely open in that, even in the preamble or the preface of the constitution said Argentina is open to anybody who wants to come to Argentina to work here. And mostly they were thinking about Europeans. Sarmiento had similar ideas. And why is this important? Because this was one of the core elements of the state they wanted to build. Okay, Rosas is gone. Now we're going to build a regime mostly based on immigrants from Western Europe with the idea that they would bring progress with themselves. They would bring civilization. They would bring capitalist entrepreneurship with themselves by the very fact of them coming. And they did not want Spaniards and Italians, mostly. They wanted mostly, uh, especially I really wanted people from Anglo-Saxon. So it's the time in which the, the, the idea of Anglo-Saxon America as opposed to Spanish America is constructed. One thing they shared, they didn't like Spain at all. So you probably know this, this period, all the elites in Latin America and Argentina, among others, have don't want to have anything to do with what they see as a very backward former empire that is the source of all the problems and it really needs to change. So these are something to keep in the back of our minds because it's all the time in the conversation uh, to the point that now you open the, the news in Argentina and they talk about the buses, 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 bill. And it's like, what is this? What is happening? Because you know, the, another famous saying, they say that if you leave Argentina for 15 days, everything changed. But if you live for 15 years, everything is the same. Uh, so this idea that there's a, like a permanent coming back of similar problems, but I bet if you live 15 days, you open the newspaper and nothing is the same. So it's like, what are they talking about? Um, so to make it very brief, just a reminder for most of you are familiar with this, and then I will focus on the main arguments. This is also the period in which Bartolomeu Mitre here, a younger uh, depiction of him, uh, was the president in 1862. It's the war uh, against Paraguay. Those years, this is the loss, the loss of territory that Paraguay uh, uh, experiencing that period. And it's a period that usually is called the Organización Nacional in, in Argentina, the, 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 the presidencies of Bartolomé Mitre and Sarmiento himself, which laid the base for this period of growth, this period that is considered the splendor period of Argentina. So this was very important because as you probably know, Paraguay was considered an alternative or a possible alternative uh, or a competitor. It was friendly politically with Rosas, who had been defeated. He was friendly with the Blancos, and the white party in Uruguay, who also had been defeated. So it's most of the time nowadays, it's considered almost a, a regional civil war, uh, you might say, uh, the Paraguayan war, which is not the topic of me today at all, but uh, the impact it had on the history of Paraguay is completely devastating, as you probably also know. So this also took place uh, in the 60s more or less at the same time, or shortly after the American Civil War. Uh, this was happening in this year. I'm not going to detail, just a reminder of this period we're talking about. And this is another main moment of this period. What in Argentina is called, well, I don't even have to translate to English, it's quite uh, obvious, it's the conquest of the desert. Uh, so you read the conquest of the desert, you imagine someone going to the desert, uh, which is empty. Of course, it was not empty. The conquest of the desert is the way uh, it used to be. Now it's kind of a term that is hard to sustain, but Millet is bringing it back uh, to take uh, the lands of the Argentinian 
political entity did not control. So by 1850s, Argentina was up to here. Or I don't see it there, up to <coughs> south of the province of La Pampa. The Patagonia was really not under control of the Argentinian state. They were indigenous people, it was not empty, but it was, so they, what in America or North America you can see as going west, in Argentina is going south, Chile also, uh, and basically defeating military, defeating uh, indigenous populations and yeah, killing a big amount of them, and then sharing the land, mostly in, in land states. This is called in Argentina, or remember in Argentina as the conquest of the desert. The main leader of it was Roca, who became president after that, not surprisingly. Until very recently, the one of the, the hundred peso bill in Argentina had Roca on one side and this image on the other side. So you would go and you see this everywhere. Then they kind of take it away and now it's going to come back any moment because uh, it's already happened. So this uh, idea, so not only national organizations, Paraguay, war, etc., but also the conquest of the desert and that settled, let's say, the issue. And after that comes the period that Millet is so proud about. Um, well, I had a pause. So I don't know. <laughs> we don't have time for that. <laughs> um, uh, so briefly, uh, what are the main uh, elements that Millet says? What and in the end, I will try to connect all, bring all the things together, and say why I think it's uh, in most cases the misuse of history. Uh, to briefly summarize, Argentina during these years, 1880, uh, like as I said, many other countries, what the Alperin Dogi called the neo-colonial. Uh, order uh, in, in, in Latin America, well, really entangles with, uh, with the capitalist world economy, uh, as many other countries were producing different things. Argentina was exporting uh, not necessarily only meat first, uh, well, uh, wool depends on the technical developments of the time. Well, this has been largely explored by many colleagues, and there's a lot written about this. Uh, first, the wool. That's a famous book by Illa Sabato about that. Uh, later, the, 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 the technology allows to export meat because before that was not possible. It would get rotten, of course, uh, along the along the ocean, along the way. Uh, that also, but also then wheat <clears throat> and Argentina becomes one of the main exporters of uh, commodities, agrar uh, agrarian pro uh, produce. Argentina is called El Granero del Mundo. The, the, uh, the, the, the producer of uh, food for the whole world, the barn of the world. Yeah. Um, so, and, and the growth is really immense. So, when you see the numbers, the, the, the growth in, 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 in the ex exports is really very big. At the same time, and I will connect this in the end, uh, this also means that Argentina, like other countries, gets a particular entanglement with that global market in which there's a strong dependency with the exportation of commodities and not other things. That doesn't mean that there's no industry in Argentina. Of course, that would be a very, a, a complete simplification. Uh, there is some industry, some light industry mostly, but the core of the economy is uh, ge geared toward the export of um, this kind of produce. And of course, uh, what comes is a lot of investments. So this is these are the years in which uh, a big amount of British investments mostly uh, set the railway um, uh, network in Argentina, investments uh, as loans to the government, investments um, in different parts of the, of, of the economy. So it is a, a connection. This is one of the arguments that is uh, br brought back again in the discussion today. Sometimes they say, well, we should go back to this period in which we entangled with the global market in a, in a way that was useful and uh, efficient for everybody <laughs> and for us. So this is also one of the arguments now in, in the discussion. We should not do things in which we are inefficient, meaning mostly industry, and we should do things in which we are efficient, which is uh, produce of the pampas, let's say. Uh, so it's a quite different discussion as in Europe. In Europe, it might be the other way around. It depends on the country, but in Argentina, it's very much like that. Uh, so that's one of the core arguments of, uh, of Millet. In political terms, this is a regime called as the Orden Conservador. This is a cartoon of Caras y Caletas, which is a very nice uh, source for all the students you might have. It's online now uh, by the National Library of Spain. Caras y Caletas was a, a, a graphic 
magazine with photos also uh, by the end of the 19th century. And this is a, a, a cartoon trying to depict the political uh, election day. Uh, so uh, they are saying, uh, who's there, who's coming? A, a vote is coming. For who? For Marcelino, Ucante? okay, then go ahead. So it's a way of saying, okay, who are you going to vote for? If you vote for the one that we want, we we'll, uh, we'll allow you to vote. He's coming with a bunch of uh, digides, let's call it, let's call it like that. <laughs> so documents for people to vote. So with those, you can vote for all these people that you have their documents here. Um, and well, it shows, of course, it's just a cartoon, but there's plenty of also research done on how election days in this period was, were, uh, well, not what we know now as an election day. This, we maybe need to get a bit more technical in this. Argentina at this time was a republic, like all the republics of the American continent, and it, did, it had formerly universal suffrage, Argentina. So there was no uh, provision that you could not vote if you didn't have a certain amount of money. All men, not women, of course, uh, older than 18, and Argentinian citizens could vote. Of course, if you take out the women, if you take out the non-Argentinian citizens, you have a much uh, smaller amount of the population. But that's not really what changed in 1912. That didn't change. What really changed in 1912 was that the process, as it was, was basically a process in which you would vote, openly say, go in somewhere and say openly, who did you vote for? So it was a whole operation that had nothing to do with what we now know as elections, because who controls the place will basically decide who wins, who doesn't. There's plenty of research on this, I think fantastic research done on this, was one of the topics I wanted to write to talk here in the beginning, how workers were also involved in these kind of practices or not, sometimes selling their vote uh, because it was convenient and they would get something at least. Uh, they're, they are in a very nice source to say, well, now I don't, can't even sell my vote anymore. So now I lost the source of uh, uh, small income on the election day and they will win anyway. Uh, so of course, if you watch, if you watch Gangs of New York, uh, of Scorsese also you get the feeling of what kind of gangs uh, could take place. Anyway, this is to say that this is by every consideration a non-democratic period in the sense of what we know later as democratic period. Uh, and this kind of a consensus among the historiography and the facts. So it's also perhaps even more surprising that he's coming back to uh, this period. Lastly, this is also the period in which, um, well, out of these migrants that they wanted, emerged not a working class, so to say. I, I, I wrote my, I, I did my PhD about this. So I wrote a book. I, I will very briefly talk about this, so just in a nutshell. Uh, it is very uh, interesting, and I have another. Well, this is a famous paper by Gandhi. Some of you here might know what is the Ley de Residencia. The Ley de Residencia was a law enacted in 1902, 24 hours after the first national strike, that allowed uh, the government, and there are many of these laws uh, in, um, in different countries, but the law allowed to, or the government to uh, expel immigrants who had been involved in uh, attacks to the public order. Basically by saying, well, they are foreigners, so we can expel them. So it was a way to say, we don't have to prove what uh, you did or why is that legal or democratic or not. We'll just say, uh, that's called the Ley de Residencia, uh, quite infamously in Argentina. So many people were expelled. Of course, many people just stepped out of the ship in Uruguay and came back. It also happened. Not everybody was really staying in the, in the boat until then the boat will stop in Santos in Brazil. So other people will jump up out of the boat there. But, well, we could talk about that. This was very important. What I want to say this, and to close this and go to the conclusions, is that what is interesting of Argentina, this period, is that in a period of 50 years, 1852 to 1902, they moved from Alberdi and saying, we want everybody to come, uh, we want people to come to say, well, now some people we want to ex expel. It's also a period of uh, resurgence of Argentina, mm -hmm nationalism, patriotism, etc. Why? Well, mostly because most of, many, not most, many of the people that had come, had come with the wrong ideas, according to them. So at this, in this period also, they start to say that anarchism and socialism are exotic 
things that are coming from Europe. Well, we wanted Europeans, but not for this, uh, basically. Uh, you are bringing things from Europe. You have to recall that uh, Buenos Aires was perhaps the number one capital of anarchism in the world, together with Barcelona in this period. Two daily newspapers, uh, two daily anarchist newspapers were published in, in Buenos Aires, one in the morning, one in the evening, uh, in 1910. Uh, just to give you an idea how powerful the movement was. They were also very trained in answering these accusations. When they were accused of being exotic, they would answer, well, you're also exotic. You also wanted uh, things from Europe. You like France, but we also like France, but we like different people from France. That's what they would answer. Um, anyway, this is to say that, as everybody also knows, this is a period of emergence of a very uh, strong, I would say, labor movement in Argentina, which is also an important element of the history of Argentina, as anybody familiar with Argentina would know. Uh, the labor movement in Argentina did not begin with uh, with Perón, uh, had a longer history, and it was in these years. I want to come back now to finish to my main conclusions. Uh, number one is that Millet is appealing to history to build or to strengthen his political movement. Uh, he's not the first one to do that, to be sure. Uh, he's doing that in a very uh, conscious way, I think. We should not under and underestimate him. Um, his nickname is sometimes El Loco. Uh, well, you might say he is, but yeah, be careful because he's also became president. So, and I think he, he knows sometimes what he tries to do. I think the most serious uh, or concerning, I would say, uh, Utilization of the past is related to a more recent period of history, and it's what is happening now with uh, um, the last dictatorship. And not to say the horrible things that are happening in terms of uh, gender with Millet. I didn't really have time to go into any of that. He changed names of uh, uh, a room in the in the national park. So it was the room of women. Now we'll change it. It will be the room of the founding fathers. So it's really. Uh, and don't forget that only very recently Argentina, after a long fight, won the right of abortion in, in 2019, I think it was. Uh, 20 was the, the, it was finally approved. Uh, so the big movement was, I think, between 2017 and 2020. Then the movement obtained that victory and somehow also to some kind of ebb. Uh, this might happen. So it's a Damocles sword that can be. Uh, the head of the Catholic Church is also an Argentinian. So that's also quite a difficult moment to, to defend some of the rights uh, against the church. Still, it's an open battle. Uh, I would say detention, but also his references to other things. This is one example, perhaps less serious, less urgent uh, as other battles of the recent history, but still it's happening. Another room he take, he changed the name, is a room that of, it was a room in the National Palace called the Room of the Originary Peoples, the Pueblos Originarios. He also changed that. And he's very soon he would probably put Roca on that. So you can imagine how serious that is. If you want to go back to name something Roca that was named after uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, this vindication of the period of the conservative age is also not new. There is, of course, Mitre himself, who was the first historian also, apart from being the president, uh, one of the first historians. Uh, did a lot to, to sustain this. And um, also among uh, historians, uh, you can recall the works of uh, perhaps uh, Cortes Conde or Diaz Alejandro. Uh, there, is, there has been a lot of work to say, well, it was quite prosperous. And of course it was a period of progress. So it's not that it's, they just took a period of uh, complete crisis. The, the question is for who this progress was, but what it meant, most, perhaps most importantly, what it meant for uh, the future. If it was, as we would say in Spanish, pan para hoy y hambre para mañana, bread for today, hunger for tomorrow. So uh, perhaps it's good now, but later on will happen. Uh, I think, where are the myths? I think, or which are the myths that uh, historical scholarship has helped to debunk and many things that Millet say now are really not capable of surviving any fact checking uh, by any academic uh, scholar. Uh, one is that he completely 
oversees the role that the state played in this. I think that, so this would have not happened without the state, because without the state, you don't win a war. Without the state, you don't uh, defeat the resistance in the interior province. Without the state, you don't conquer the desert. Uh, you need a state. And with that, I mean mostly you need an army, you need a national army. You need, as so many people have said, to, this, to, this, to, to, to set up this liberal uh, paradise, the state was very much needed. Um, the Eurocentric uh, biases of all these uh, intellectuals of the period is sometimes overlooked, and to the point that you see uh, statements like uh, Alberto Fernandez, yeah, we come from the from the ships. How can you say that in in 2021? I think 22 when he said so. Uh, this is com sometimes completely overlooked, and I think this one deficit sometimes of Argentinian historiography that doesn't really place that in the context of broader discussions in which this. Uh, uh, white settler uh, policies were in, in many other places. Another important myth or a topic that seems uh, to go unexplained in this survey is, okay, what were the conditions in which Argentina uh, entangled with the global market? Was that really convenient in the long run? Of course, you have a lot, a bookshelf of this. You have dependency theory, you have hundreds of years of writing about this, so you get the point. Uh, okay. Was this really good? Are we again discussing if this was really the, the, the way to go? So it seems like a lot of discussions are really coming to the, to the starting point. Uh, was it seriously uh, this David Ricardo idea, the best comparative uh, uh, advantages of each land? Are we going back to that? It seems sometimes like a, like a drama, like 50 years of discussions go back and start over again. Um, Another aspect that goes overlooked is the repressive nature of that state in that, in that period against, as I said, the indigenous populations, of course, uh, the limits of the democracy, democratic regime of that period that is presented as a golden cage. And lastly, and perhaps the topic that Milady would like to engage more, was that such a golden age for many of the people that were there? Uh, I, I put it only in the last place because I think this should be only a small part of the discussion. I came across these questions online and said, well, but what was the what was the salary in Argentina in this period? Was it higher than uh, in France? Of course, we can go into that. There's plenty of literature to go into that also. It was higher sometimes, but everything was much more expensive. So yeah, in the end of the day, it uh, didn't really matter so much. Most of the people wanted to send money back to their countries. So it's not that they had that money and they would not send it. But you only have to look at all the scholarship that we have in that period on the conditions of work, conditions of housing, the struggles for the improvement of those conditions to get the idea that if this was a golden age, at least it was not a golden age for everybody. Uh, it was a golden age for some people uh, that went to Europe. You know, uh, in, in Argentina, we have the expression that someone has la vaca atada. You know what that means? Ever heard of that? To have the, the cow tied up. Uh, so that means that you're really rich. And that meant that was because rich Argentinians would travel to Europe, to Paris mostly. They, I think they didn't come to Amsterdam. Uh, they wanted to go to Paris. They would go with their own cow because they wanted to have butter uh, or milk uh, fresh uh, in the ship. So they were really rich. So people were talking about were really, really rich. Uh, and but of course, it's kind of obvious. And sometimes I get angry that we have to be discussing this. That was for certain part of the population and many others uh, were living in horrible conditions. You can only see the primary sources of the time in which many labor uh, newspapers would write to labor newspapers in Europe saying, don't come. It's not true what they say. Uh, don't come or be aware that it's not exactly what they are telling you, etc. cetera. Um, many of these reasons, uh, I think all of these reasons are well known and there are many scholars uh, and uh, experts and are arguing. I have the impression, unfortunately, that it doesn't really matter sometimes in the discussion. So in the discussion, in this, this political discussion, you can give hundreds of arguments. Um, sometimes it's like uh, useless. The, the followers of, of Millet uh, are hard to conversate with, to say the least. Uh, 
But still, it's important, I think, that we as historians uh, engage in these uh, debates. And those of us who are in the possibility to do so, to do also more things that just engage in the discussion because things are happening. There was a, a, a whole a strike in, in all education levels yesterday in Argentina. So things are unfolding as we speak. So we will see more. Hopefully in a year or four years or five years, this will be a, a sad moment that we had to do a talk about a, a sad moment that fortunately did not succeed, but it's not clear yet where it's going to end. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I will invite Michiel to uh, to stand over there because we are recording the talk and the uh, uh, discussions, remarks, and then we'll stop the recording and we'll have our conversation. Okay, I will stand here, although I think that the discussion should stay seated and <laughs> to leave the floor for you. Um, um, sometimes you do... Um, uh, naive things, and I my naive thing was to say, well, I'm discussing today, and you had a very rich uh, uh, talk, and I have to be uh, uh, spontaneously trying to uh, make some sense out of it. Um, let me start by something positive. I'm an historian, you are an historian. These circumstances make at least the discipline of history relevant and urgent and important, and I think that is uh, uh, nice to see. Um, on the, the other hand, or let me say a second thing, I'm an, of course an outsider, I live in the Netherlands, uh, I look at Argentina from here, uh, and that has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the disadvantage is that you don't feel what's happening, and I think you really uh, gave us a feeling what's happening today in, in the uh, universities, in the streets, etc. The advantage is that you can sometimes be a little bit more, uh, take a little bit more distant, uh, distance, be a little bit more uh, analytical, and perhaps a little bit uh, provocative. So I will try to uh, to use these uh, examples. But first, uh, use these advantages. I want to, because you gave this talk about how, or, or your beginning on how Millet uh, um, is destroying much of what's, uh, what we consider valuable on, in Argentine society. And I think it is important for us to realize why he at least got this majority in the second round. Um, and I think we cannot, and, and there is no discussion in, in, on Argentina that you can uh, um, not mention the Peronism. And I think especially the, the two de decades of the Kirchner regime, uh, uh, and also, although Albert Fernandez was not a Kirchner, he was, uh, he belonged to that. And I think w while we, in the beginning, when Nestor Kirchner was taking uh, the presidency, we, that it was a, we saw it as a positive development, uh, this, uh, the Kirchners became an inept, a corrupt, uh, pork and barrel kind of political movement uh, that, um, captured the institutions that that uh, um, uh, fueled the inflation that you talked about. That was also arrogant in many ways. Um, I, I was watching when Millet uh, took the stand in the, as a president, and uh, Christina Fiesna had a long white uh, uh, red dress on, and she was uh, like there. She was very kind of she she. Um, didn't show the respect that perhaps uh, and, uh, she should have to, um, um, uh, showed. And so La Casta, that Millet is, is, uh, is um, uh, well, talking about, uh, we know in the Netherlands we also have some political parties that, call, that, that talk about the caste, uh, but, but, the caste, but we in the La Casta was really uh, uh, something that had, um, provoked a lot of resistance in, in Argentine society. And, and Millet used this resistance uh, to, uh, he used this empty uh, sentiment. And of course the results are terrible. And, and I think I personally, I'm most, um, uh, well, afraid for the social media street violence kind of uh, um, uh, results that we are not yet seeing in its full, uh, but we could see much more in the future, especially also because Argentina, Argentine, Argentine politics, they uh, often take place at streets. And so I'm, I feel very, very bad about it. Um, but he, um, he used this anti-sentiment to, to get the majority. Um, and what he did, and I think that is also, he used the revolutionary rhetoric 
of uh, of Peronism uh, for his very right wing uh, politics. Uh, Viva la libertad carajo. Uh, Viva la revolución carajo. Uh, that, but he he kind of uh, turned it around and 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 uh, uh, invented a narrative that well at least. Uh, seduced uh, the majority or more than half of the uh, Argentine population, but also the IMF. I mean, it is amazing the IMF in Argentina have been struggling for or, or uh, fighting for 50 years. And now the IMF is, is really uh, so nice to Millet. It's unbelievable. And, and so there is, because they are very happy that uh, um, uh, the Kirchner's have gone. So um, he, he used this, this uh, this anti-sentiment to get uh, um, uh, the political leadership. And now he's rewriting history, as you showed very, uh, very clearly. Um, he's doing it in two ways. You showed uh, the memoria the, of the dictatorship and the, the more uh, the, the history of the late 19th century. I would say, and uh, these are uh, speculations, I would say that his talk about the Orden Conservador is more genuine. It's more ideological. He's, he's looking for an ideological um, a foundation for his, uh, um, for his uh, regime, so to say, and for his uh, ideas. The, the, the talk about the dictatorship is much more opportunistic, I would say. It's more political uh, uh, instrument. Yeah, and, and also provoking in many ways. I, I come back to that. So first on your, uh, on, on his um, going back to the Orden Conservador, um, it is interesting that conservatism in the 19th century was basically anti-liberal. Uh, they, they wanted the state to be important, the religion to be very important. So how is he or, uh, um, um, solving this, this tension that he goes back to conservatism while he himself has an ultra-libertarian, li liberal uh, ideology? And, and secondly, that's something I don't know anything about, but this, I was thinking the role of religion. How is his position to, towards religion in this uh, going back to the 19th century. If you go to the dictatorship, there's also this rewriting and this uh, little um, uh, video, very well made, I must say, it's very smooth and very, it's, uh, I, I would say, you said, don't look at it, I say, watch it, because it is important, yeah. because it's, it is an, a new way of, of looking at, at the recent history um, that is, uh, amazing in many ways and, and disconcerting. But I would say that he that he is doing this because we historians, uh, and I say we because I also participate in that, we um, let something happen in our discussion on the dictatorship that perhaps we should not have uh, um, let ha that happen. <laughs> Sorry for the bad English. Um, the, the memoria discussion, the, 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 the memory of the dictatorship was captured very much appropriated by the Peronist government in the past decades, and we let that happen. So there was there was a, a discussion, or there was a situation that you could only talk about the dictatorship in in one specific way. Of course, there were conservative ways, but they were not they were silenced in many ways and not heard. And and he is that's why I said it's instrumental. Or strategic to use the the memory of the dictatorship because he is he can in a way silently attack Peronist thinking and 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 all the Peronist institutions that are important in in this discussion. So it is a speculation, but I I feel that this is a very important element, and I think that we or Argentine historians have um, um, allowed, so to say, a little bit too much. That the, the, the Kirchner governments have have appropriated has appropriated uh, the historical discourse. So, so it's a question: Am I right? What do you think about it? Um, but I think the good thing could be that in the coming years we will see something like what we in Germany we call the historical state, the, the, the struggle among historians in the academia, but also in uh, on in the street and the newspapers on what is our history, what what are the the, the criteria to, to judge, uh, the, how can we get a, a more nuanced or a more profound um, uh, um, discussion about our recent past? So I think uh, I'm optimistic in that sense, uh, uh, 
I'm not optimistic. I, I try to be optimistic, but I think this this new vision on, on this tree is it turns out well, it can turn out very badly because then uh, Milai will uh, capture the historical discussion. But perhaps we can have an, a more open discussion um, uh, that uh, may be fruitful also for historians. And the last question we all have to face in the Netherlands, in Europe, in the United States, in Argentina, how do we approach this situation where all of a sudden uh, uh, the, the, the mainstream, the things that we believed in, the, the, the knowledge we believed in is uh, uh, thrown away in, in by, uh, by the people in power. How, what do we do? Um, can we, uh, do we have to um, uh, wage a war with, with arguments or do we have to wage an, another war? And so that's a question that you not cannot answer, but it's a question that I ask myself many times. Thank you. Lucas, because of time, um, maybe if you want to take on one of Michiel's questions uh, and, and answer uh, before I open up the floor. No, thanks very much. Um, I must say, uh, I agree with everything you added. Uh, um, I, I agree with you, and I think it was a, good, a very good, um, insightful comment. I, I agree that it's more genuine what he says uh, about this period, mm -hmm. because he had been saying that for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, what he's saying about the dictatorship is quite new. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's more genuine because he, is, he needs to construct also his own uh, tradition. Uh, and one place where he searches for is Alberti, so the, the liberal uh, tradition. And, and the, that connects to, to also what you said, how he makes sense of the fact that they were conservative and liberal. Perhaps it's easier than we think because they were not so conservative, but they were liberal. Uh, I mean, they were called the conservative order later on also, but they were not called the conservative party only later on that came. They were liberals, they were very much anti-church. Uh, they were liberal in the, nine, in the end of the 19th century uh, way, like many other elites in Latin America. Uh, so uh, that's not so problematic with him. Uh, what comes here, I, and I, I drop two important things here. Uh, one, and then I go to the Latin America, then we open the floor. One important, very important factor here is the vice president. She's Victoria Michelle Raquel. And she is very much deeply into the military. Deeply. Uh, some people even say there's a chance that uh, she will end up being president in a house of cards kind of moment. Uh, um, and that's not completely to be discussed. She really has deep connections to the lawyers of the military who went to trial. Uh, she herself has family connections and she really comes from there. And sometimes you get the impression that she is might be the driving force of this that he really does in a most uh, instrumental way. And uh, she comes from a completely different uh, background. She's not the libertarian kind of thing. So she's uh, much more of a Bolsonaro, if we might try to draw a connection there. And Millet is much more of a Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan kind of person. Because also he's not builders in that sense. He's constructing, he's living in that galaxy. Builders was one of the first politicians who uh, congratulated him. So it's certainly the same kind of galaxy. Trumpist, Le Pen, Orban, Bolsonaro, but he's not, he has nothing, no, Muslims have no place in this discourse, etc. He's not religious. Also. And I must say that I very much agree with what you said about uh, the reasons that Millet won, because Millet won the election. Nobody contests that result. Nobody says, okay, he was fraud, he was on the military coup. He won the election and he still has more than 50% of support. And more disturbingly sometimes, we might say he has a lot of support among uh, the working poor. The more uh, and the, when I, with the working poor, I mean the the, the people who not have, who have casual contracts, who don't work in the in the in the state in any way, or don't get a subsidy of the state in any way. So that's uh, very serious. And the main reason he won, I think, and everybody agrees, it don't have to, is because you have to have fifty percent inflation. You can't win an election. If you're the Minister of Economy, that Sergio Massa was. Even, even with all the corruption, you might win an election. Uh, because in the end, 
people vote with their pockets, or and, and that, rightly so. So nobody ever won an election in, in Argentina with that disaster in the economy. And another element, I have no time, that explains also the right way here, is the pandemic. Another very important element, I think, that explains uh, the pandemic or the, re the, the, the measures about the pandemic. Uh, there was not a strong anti-vaxxer movement in Argentina or Latin America for that matter. But many things that you see on, in the anti-vaxxer, anti, uh, you get my, my point, you see very much in the voter of Millet. Oh, these are the people who were posting on Instagram because they had a salary uh, and I was losing my job. Uh, because I had to go and now I have to have a 50% inflation. So I think the richness of that is completely indispensable if you want to understand how this happened. But we can discuss later on. <laughs> yes, thank you, uh, Lucas. I think, uh, Bridget, if you can end the recording for now so everyone can.